right, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Wolf, and uh, I've been a Microsoft MVP for 22 years. Uh, uh, I actually met Mahesh uh, in Redmond at a uh, an MVP summit. And we discovered the two of us don't live too far away. And so we've been doing community stuff together for well over 15 years. Um, I primarily worked as a contractor for my career, uh, you know, starting in the 80s. That was the 1980s. And uh, um, I worked with lots of different technologies. I was a very early adopter of the .NET framework and uh, SQL Server things that I still use daily in my job. Um, about uh, six months ago, um, I was uh, I was actually considering retirement and, uh, uh, you know, sent some feelers out and I got an interesting offer from a company in California named Simpson Strong Tie. And what they wanted to do is take a, uh, a large suite of applications and move them from on-premise to the cloud. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I know a lot about the cloud stuff. I can show you how to do that because I've done that at other clients. So what I'm going to show you today is uh, sort of my journey discovering what they have and thinking about how to apply it to the cloud. Uh, just so everybody understands, I am primarily Microsoft focused. So all of this talk will be Azure based, but you could do the same thing in AWS or Google or some other cloud uh, environment. So uh, what what we have at uh, Simpson Strong Tie, uh, what, what does that company do? Um, we make connectors for the building trades. So if you have a deck, uh, your deck is probably held together with little metal uh, connectors with bolts in them. We manufacture all that stuff by the millions. And we also make things for commercial uh, construction things that would help buildings withstand hurricanes. So we have a lot of engineering and a lot of manufacturing capability. Since we sell so much of that kind of stuff, we develop software applications that the building trades can use to help sell our materials. And uh, I'm, I'm working currently uh, with a suite of applications that are written well over 10 years ago. They are C-sharp based. They're written in WPF. And it's all a traditional client server where they're actually uh, talking directly to a SQL database installed on the user's machine. They don't even work in an environment where they have a central server. Each person has their own SQL server and their own SQL reporting services. And you can imagine this is a bear to support and maintained. Uh, they did all of this because 10, 15 years ago, connectivity in a trust manufacturing plant was minimal. So they made it so each person could sort of work independently. We have to get the customers off that mindset and say, well, if everybody's connected, we can put it in the cloud, then everybody shares the same install, the same versions, a lot easier to support, we can optimize performance. So that was my mandate when I accepted the position. And uh, as I mentioned here, the one application I'm working with, just one of them has 5,000 databases and it uses the Microsoft Sync framework to uh, synchronize within a particular customer facility. And uh, they're just a lot of old technology. Uh, the other thing they've done, they've done is they've taken uh, advantage of the file system. So they use the file system to store some of the design information and also documents that have to do with buildings like code enforcement uh, submissions. So how are we going to take all this stuff and move it to the cloud? Interesting question. Well, the easy thing, and, and if you do... You know, if you attend a Microsoft demo, they'll say, here, you just make a, a Blazor app and make a, a API and you publish to the cloud. And it's like, yeah, that works real well for a simple application. But what if you're going to do this for thousands of enterprise users and you want it to be, you know, uh, four nines reliability, stuff like that. There's a lot more that goes into that. 
So we're going to start with the ability to convert the app. And, and it's sort of a natural conversion for us to go from WPF to Blazor, somewhat related technologies. Um, and everything, of course, is written in C Sharp. Very, very few things are done in JavaScript at all. For the, uh, for the service layer, we would use minimal APIs. Um, I prefer those. Um, and then we use a mix of Entity Framework and Dapper as the uh, relational uh, database connectivity. This, the databases, instead of having like 5,000 of them out at the clients, we're going to consolidate that into one multi-tenant database. And believe me, that, that's a, a hard sell to convince our business people and our customers that one database can, can handle this. But I've worked in other industries where that was clearly the case, could easily be done. And I've already built a proof of concept to show that this will work fine. The other thing I, I uh, looked at is, well, we don't want to use the file system because they're used to just taking like reports or design files and saving them to a local share. Well, your web browser can't do that. The user has to intervene. They have to say, okay, I'll accept this download and put it in this folder. So the way to get around that is to store all the documents in the cloud. And you'd be amazed how inexpensive it is Right now in my uh, proof of concept, I have 3 million documents stored uh, in Azure storage and it's costing us about you know $20 a month to store that. Uh, but something you may not be aware of when you use Azure storage, um, it has something called index tags. So think of that as metadata. So each document you can, you can put in like the GUID that associates with the database you can put in like a category of class, what kind of document it is. And then you don't have to maintain a separate SQL table that matches to each document. You actually use Azure storage as a database and you can query it. And the, the response time is just extremely impressive. The other thing, of course, we'll take advantage of is Redis caching. And Redis caching allows us to take frequently used data like lookup tables or uh, pictures that the uh, customer just looked at and store them in a cache because they may want to look at them three minutes from now and uh, put all that together and we can get a pretty fancy uh, performant environment. So that is our plan. Now, as a developer, how do I set that up on my machine? Well. You know, you could just go to Visual Studio or VS Code, say file new project and create a new project. And that works to a point. When you get into something this large, and uh, I didn't tell you that this is one of like 10 different applications that I'm working with. Then you start to think, well, 10 applications, I bet they all need authentication. They all need document management. Then you start thinking about building a platform. So the platform becomes a set of services in Azure that is shared by multiple applications. And those services probably all are going to be API projects in some degree. Well, how are we going to get all that down to a developer's desktop so that they can actually step through the code and understand how everything works? And Microsoft invented this technology over the last year called Aspire. So I'm a big fan of Aspire. And we use that to take all the projects and the front end and have them appear in a, um, a, a large solution. And what happens is there's something in Aspire called a host. And the host use orchestration to load the other projects and make them so they're all discoverable between each other. Uh, Excellent uh, 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 technology. You should look at Aspire if you have a chance. Some of the things you would use in Aspire, like Redis, you can simulate using Docker. Um, and the other thing that's real nice about Aspire is it has a monitoring dashboard where all the telemetry information is uh, 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 shown in a very visual way, very easy to use. So. Now we have to take, now that we built some stuff on our laptop and we're going to publish it to the web, where do we publish it? Well, there's a lot to learn in Azure. And, uh, you know, there's books. 
I, I just, most of my information I get from Microsoft Learn and reading the documentation. But um, in Azure, there's a whole hierarchy that you have to understand. And depending on the size of company you're in, it's very likely you have very limited visibility to what's really going on. Um, if you work at my level as a, as a senior architect, um, they'll say, okay, Bill, you're allowed to see everything we're doing in Azure so you can help us make it better. And then you learn about things called management groups. Management groups are basically where you put individual developers and users so that they can see things in Azure. And that's sort of your top level. And then below that, they have these things called subscriptions. A subscription is a tie to what's called an offer. An offer implies the cost that you're going to have. Highly recommend that you learn about dev test subscriptions. They reduce the cost so that when you're doing development and QA testing, you're not paying full charge for your database, your storage, and, and your uh, event uh, applications. Inside the subscriptions, you're then going to place resource groups. And the resource groups are basically a logical container. Think of it like a folder, or if you're a SQL person, think of it like a database. And inside there, you can have various resources. A resource would be something like a database, a website, a log, things like that. So you have to sort of understand this. Now, a lot of developers don't even need to touch this. You can have your architect or more likely your DevOps person set all this up for you. And then when you go to check in your source code and you do your pull request, you might have CI CD in place that automatically takes your code and puts it into the correct resources so that the users can see the results. Um, but somebody in your organization has to understand this stuff and has to embrace it. Now, where do we put our web applications? Well, typically when you see a demo, they put them in an app service. An app service is cloud native. It's a way to put a front end or a back end, you know, your Blazor or your API. You can put them in a website and they're attached to what's called an app service plan. An app service plan basically indicates a, loca a geographic location and then also sort of a, you know, a costing vehicle um, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is something newer called the container app. A container app actually takes your front end and sort of puts it into a Linux container and then runs from within there. It's sort of like a scaled down Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the cloud way to do containers uh, where Docker would be more the desktop version. So those are all different ways that you can work with. In our design, we're, we're leaning towards container apps. Um, and uh, um, then a container app, uh, you can uh, scale that by adding additional containers if you get a large load uh, for some uh, reason. Other things to consider uh, are using serverless uh, coding approaches like functions or logic apps. And excellent thing for developers to learn. Um, if you think you want to write a, a, a very complex API, eventually you'll get that done and you'll push it to the web. But if you want somebody to see sort of an example of what you're doing, make a function that sort of reads the same data from the database and returns it back. Uh, and then that you can have other developers or you can show your, your uh, business people what the data is going to look like before you actually have the full-blown uh, uh, API service created. So I often use functions in, a, in, in conjunction with um, container apps and uh, when I build services. Where are we going to put the data? Well, that's a that's a fascinating thing to learn. I said there were, there were 5,000 databases, and that's just one of my applications. Um, some of the other applications have many hundreds or thousands also. So Part of my job is to figure out how can we sort of, you know, herd all of the databases into something more manageable. And um, Microsoft offers multiple ways to host SQL natively in Azure. Uh, they have what are called vCore 
uh, subscriptions, DTU, and Hyperscale. So Hyperscale is the newest and um, and sort of the fanciest. Um, and then uh, vCore has a serverless option. And, and the reason I bring up serverless, if you set up a development environment and you use vCore as your choice of database, then you can mark it as serverless and you can tell it to turn off after 30 minutes of activity, of inactivity. That saves you some money. And if you're in a shop where you're only developing like, you know, eight hours a day, well, that's 40 hours out of 168 for the, the week. So basically you can program your database to not charge anything to your account while you're not using it. Great, great thing to do. So there's different ways to do this. The other thing you can do with SQL databases, you can put them in pools. There's a thing called a, an elastic pool. And what that does, rather than reserve a certain amount of compute and storage for a particular database, you reserve a compute and storage quota and share it across dozens of databases. And then if one is active, it takes the compute the, and then it dies down and then another one becomes active. So you have to look at sort of the trends of how you use your data to see what is going to be the best solution for you. Um, in terms of storage, I mentioned I'm storing millions of documents already. I'm projecting uh, in, in two or three years, we'll easily have 250 million documents. Not concerned about that at all. Uh, Azure is designed to handle lots more than that. Uh, but you have to sort of understand how to work with blobs. And the biggest thing I want you to study is this thing called index tags. It makes quite a difference in how fast you can access and search for a document and then download it as needed. Uh, Redis Cache is, uh, you know, that's an industry standard uh, used in a lot of open source projects. Uh, they do have a native uh, Redis Cache built into Azure. So we will take advantage of that. And the other thing in terms of data management I would mention is a key vault. And the key vault is where you put your secrets. And by secrets, I mean things like connection strings, uh, things that you don't want all the developers to know what they are. And then typically DevOps or your security ops person manages the secrets and doesn't let the uh, uh, the desk developer actually know what's going on. And that's how we protect uh, environments like staging and production. Now, if you're used to doing desktop apps, you probably haven't done a lot of event-driven programming. And the there are two things that I want you to think about in the Azure space. One's called event grid and one's called service bus. Event grid is where a device can publish to some endpoint. And then other routines like a worker app, a container worker app, can subscribe to that endpoint and pick things off the queue. And we're looking at that as a way to transfer data from our old legacy uh, software up to the cloud um, and then also it's really good for things that are like workflow related. So for instance, um, the software I, I work on is used to design roof trusses. So those are those big wooden things that have the little metal plates in them that hold up your roof. And if you have one of those, you can say, gee, I know Bill Wolf who works at Simpson, they manufacture all those plates. And they make software to help uh, builders design the shape of the truss. And if you don't have the proper size wood and the proper plates, your truss falls down in the snow. We don't want that to happen. Well, when we do a project, you know, we're going to we're going to have a bid. Then we're going to have the bid accepted. Though, to me, those are events. Um, then I'm going to have the, the whole truss system designed for a roof. Then I have to send that to code enforcement to have it, but they are called sealed. And then that once it's sealed, I can put it down to the production floor and have it manufactured. Then somebody can load it on a truck. The truck drives it over to a construction site and delivers it. And then the installers actually take it and install it. 
to me, each of those is events. Well, that's what you would use event grid for. Every time one of these things happens, I want to fire an event, and then my software can sort of put in a task table and say, this is when everything was completed. And uh, it's a real nice way to work. Um, and event grid supports MQTT, which is a, like sort of an industry standard way to do messaging. Now, if you have a number of services, I said we're going to have a platform across multiple applications. If you have a number of services on the cloud that need to talk to each other, then the way to do that is called service bus. And what that does is allows you to decouple your applications and have something say, okay, the design's done, post a, uh, an event onto the service bus, and then maybe the reporting engine picks up that event and says, oh, you want me to build all of the formal reports for this design and uh, put them in document storage or email them to somebody showing them that they're ready. So these are things that I would recommend you start looking at. It's sort of a different way to program. You're using the entire cloud uh, and, and having different components talk to each other uh, in an orchestrated fashion. Now, once you get all the stuff in the cloud, then you have to say, well, we got to secure this. We got to protect it. And uh, one of the ways to do that is uh, you set up gateways. You set up, uh, there's an API center that Microsoft provides as part of Azure. And it can have policies and restrict who can get to your APIs and when. You can have private endpoints. You can have things called peer subnets where you can have two services like within the cloud talk to each other, but nobody from outside can talk to them. So there's a whole sort of science to how you set up your network and secure it so you can keep out bad actors. One of my favorite parts of the cloud is monitoring. And, and once you get into cloud native, um, I mean, some of us grew up like reading text logs from the C drive. This is much, much fancier. And, uh, you know, Microsoft has this thing called App Insights. It's been upgraded, and now it relies on something called Log Analytics Workspace to actually store the logging information. Once you start collecting these logs, you can then query them, and you can query them using a language called Custo, K-U-S-T-O, um, and uh, it's shortened to KQL for Custo Query Language. So you query your logs, and then these can be used to generate <coughs> uh, alerts, which would be email messages if you got a bunch of errors, or you could put them in a workbook. A workbook would be a set of instructions that allows somebody to run a set of queries and learn what the status is of a particular application. <coughs> and finally, they can be displayed on a nice dashboard. Now, the dashboards are typically in the Azure portal. And that's okay if you're a developer or you're an architect. What if you want your product management people to see the results of your app? Well, then we have to publish the, da the dashboard a different way. And Microsoft has in Azure something called a managed Grafana service. And Grafana is sort of the industry leading way of doing uh, telemetry dashboards uh, in the cloud and on websites. So we're using Grafana to publish uh, the custo queries as uh, tables and as charts so that we can show business people like, you know, this is how many trusses we built today, or this is how many errors we got last week, stuff like that. The other thing I'd ask you to research is something in Microsoft has now called Database Watcher. So Database Watcher is a, a newer technology. It replaces what is called SQL Insights. And uh, Database Watcher basically sits in the background and does a bunch of queries to your database. It doesn't really impact the performance of your database. It's querying the underlying system tables, those sys dot things. And, uh, and it collects a whole bunch of statistics and things. So you can go to the, the dashboard and Database Watcher and say, Show me how many queries I'm getting per second. Show me how many users I had today. Uh, show me my top queries and how long they're taking to run. And then it gives you useful hints and say, like, 
well, you have, you know, 62 indexes, but you're only using 44 of them. Do you want to get rid of the rest? So Database Watch is an excellent tool. Um, some of you in the database world might be used to using Regate as a tool. Well, Database Watcher is sort of the cloud equivalent of Regate. Now, <clears throat> you're not going to have somebody sit at the Azure portal and actually build all of this technology one piece at a time. You're going to automate it. And when you automate it, you're going to do something called infrastructure as code. And the uh, sort of the, the darling of the industry there, uh, uh, there's a, a, I think it's called Terraform is the language uh, that people use to build resources in the cloud. Uh, but that is more prevalent in AWS. In Microsoft, they looked at that and they said, we can do better. And they built their own language called Bicep. And Bicep has full support, Visual Studio Code especially, and also Visual Studio. And uh, basically what it is, it's a uh, declarative language where you define, you know, Azure has hundreds of different types of resources. Each one of them is uh, accessible through Bicep. So you can create a new storage account. You can say what size you want it to have. You can tell it whether you want to use cold storage or hot storage as a default. All these things can be scripted. And then when you first build your resources, you use Bicep to do that. But you can also take Bicep and introduce it into your DevOps pipeline so that it automatically checks to make sure the Azure resource has the proper settings when it does a build into a very uh, various environments. So Bicep is abs absolutely a language you want to learn a little bit about. When you do your deployments, as I said, uh, you know you can use GitHub. You can, there's lots of tools you can use. Jenkins, you know, there's lots of build tools out there. Uh, we're we're uh, focusing on Azure DevOps. It just fits into their environment the best. And we're going to build pipelines that do CI, CD. Uh, it can read from any Git repo. We happen to be a Bitbucket shop. So it reads from the Bitbucket uh, repo whenever you do you know, a pull request. And then it automatically uh, can set up and deploy. Uh, it, it, it does its build on, on virtual machines. And then it automatically deploys the code uh, to your app service or your app container, wherever you need it to go. Uh, it can also be set up to do uh, database upgrades as well. So security and threat detection. Well, two Microsoft technologies you want to consider, Defender and Sentinel. Um, Defender, uh, basically, it will go and look at your code and look for threats and known problems and report back to you. You can actually have it stop a build if it finds something. Um, and then Sentinel is the thing that would do things like uh, denial of service attacks. So it sits there and sort of blocks uh, bad actors coming into your network. It's a whole whole interesting area to learn about security on, on the cloud. So th some of the tools I use, um, I use Draw.io to do all my architectural drawings. It's open source. It's a free download. Um, the draw IO drawings can then be pasted into PowerPoint or right into a JIRA confluence page, things like that. So uh, very easy to work with. Um, I prefer, well, I use a mix of Visual Studio and VS Code. When I'm in VS Code, I use REST Client, which is a extension that's used for testing APIs. And then I use Microsoft Playwright. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Microsoft has an excellent uh, tool that does both API and screen testing. So you can actually point it at a web front end and have it look at the screen and say, okay, pretend you click this button. Once you did, then look at the grid and tell me how many rows are there. And it will actually uh, allow you to run tests um, that are uh, working with the front end design as well as the API. And finally, we take a lot of advantage of GitHub uh, Copilot writing code. And uh, um, I highly recommend that. You know, you basically, when you're coding, you can ask questions and you can type something and say, like, you know, is there a better way to do this method? And it'll come back and say, well, why don't you try it this way? Um, so then you don't actually have to talk to any other developers. 
you just talk to your AI friend. A uh, great way to live. So other things, um, obviously, for SQL Server, you want a SQL Management Studio. If you're not aware and you're using Azure Blobs, you want to download what's called Storage Explorer. Again, free tool. Uh, Microsoft also has Data Explorer and Custo Explorer if you want to look at your uh, um, uh, at your Custo queries and, and your dashboards. So in conclusion, there's a lot to learn when you move to the cloud. Um, your developers that are writing all your C-sharp code don't necessarily have to know all the stuff I just mentioned. They just have to know how to write code possibly inside a .NET Aspire framework. And then you need a DevOps person that can then take and publish that uh, code once it's checked in to the proper resources in Azure. Uh, but you absolutely need an architect or a DevOps person that, that understands the Azure world and important things like performance and cost. Um, the best way to learn all this stuff is to go to Microsoft Learn. That's what I do for most of what I do. So um, hopefully you've enjoyed this and uh, enjoy the conference and uh, hope you get a lot out of it. Have a good day.